Erev Shabbat Shalom Rabotai. We are continuing with our Mishnah Yumi Mesechet Chala. We are up to Perek Aleph Mishnah Bet. Today's Mishnah should be Leilu Nishmat Neria Ben Svetlana Aran Baev and Eliyahu Ben Burcha Yisraelov Menuchatam Megan Eden. Amen. Today's Mishnah is going to continue to list halachot that apply only to the five species of grain that we said in yesterday's Mishnah, which was wheat, barley, spelled oats, and rye. The Torah obligates each person to eat matzah, which is unleavened bread made of flour and water on the first night of Pesach. Another biblical law prohibits eating chametz on Pesach. Chametz, again, is grain that was allowed to ferment, which we call leaven. For example, dough that was allowed to rise. The Mishnah now discusses these halachot. Someone who eats a kazait, the volume of an olive, of matzah, made from any of these five species on the first night of Pesach, has fulfilled his obligation to eat matzah. The Mithoshim explained generally, in order to fulfill a mitzvah that requires eating, one must eat a minimum of a kazait. Similarly, someone who eats something prohibited by the Torah is liable to punishment only if he eats at least a kazait. Now, however, if he eats matzah made from other species of grain, he has not filled his obligation. And the Foshim explain, we learn from a pasuk that matzah can be made only from grain that can become chametz. Right? The, the Rav quotes the pasuk in Sefer Dvarim, chapter 16, pasuk 3. Lo tochal alav chametz shivat yamim tochal alav matzot. So the Chazal are not dvarim abayim lidi chimutz. Um, items that can cause fermentation, that become fermented. Adam yotze ba'em yidei chovat matzah. Dvarim she'en ba'em yidei chimutz. En adam yotze ba'em yidei chovat matzah. Now, the Mishnah will soon teach us that only the five species of grain can become chametz if left to rise. So therefore, only these species can be used for the mitzvah of matzah. Other species like rice cannot be used. It speaks about this more in the Gemara Mesech Pesachim, page 35a. The Mishnah continues, Kazait chametz chayav bi'ikaret. Similarly, someone who chas v'shalom eats a kazait of chametz of these grain is liable to karet if he eats them on Pesach. But other leavened grains are not prohibited since they are not considered chametz. And the Varshim explain, one who eats a kazait of chametz on Pesach is subject, is punished with karet. The Torah tells us in Sefer Shemot, chapter 12, Pasuk 19. Now, dough of any of these five species can become chametz and are therefore subject to this isur. Other grains like rice or millet cannot become chametz, even if they were mixed with water and fermented. That is not considered le- leavening, but rather spoilage. And the Mishnah continues, If one of the five species became chametz and became mixed with any other type of food, for example, one of the five grains was used to make Babylonian kutach, a dip made from sour milk and moldy breadcrumbs, now, one who owns this mixture on Pesach transgresses the Torah prohibition of having chametz in one's possession. The Torah, the prohibition of leaving chametz in one's possession is learned from Psukim of the Torah in Sefer Shemot, chapter 12, Pasuk 19, and chapter 13, Pasuk 7. I, uh, right, the Pasuk is Bali Re, Bali Matzeh. Even chametz that is mixed, the Mephoshim say mixed with a different food, is still subject to this Yisrael. The Mishnah now discusses which types of grain are included when one makes a nether, a vow that prohibits bread or grain. Hanodel minapat uminatvua, one who makes a nether prohibiting himself from eating bread or from eating tvua, which is grain. Asubam is forbidden to eat bread or grain of the five species, meaning if he made a nedel prohibiting bread, he may not eat bread of the five species. And if he made a nedel prohibiting grain, he may not eat grain of the five species. He is permitted, however, to eat bread or grain of other species because when people say bread or tivua grain, they refer only to the five species of grain. These are the words of Rabbi Meir. The Voshim explained as a rule, the meaning of a nedel is determined by how people commonly speak, by the vernacular. Now, while there are many types of bread, when people say bread without specifying which type, they mean bread made from any of the five species. In a place where bread is made from all of these species, that's what they're referring to, one of the five species. Now, bread made from other species, however, is not included. The reason being because bread from other species like corn or, uh, or rice is not, is not known simply as bread, but rather rice bread or corn bread. Therefore, if someone makes a neder of vow prohibiting bread, 
it is it is it includes only these five species. Now, similarly, when people say tivua grain, they refer only to the five species. Therefore, a nedel made with this word is also limited to these five species. These are the words that will be made, like we said. Now, another term used to describe grain is dagan, literally pile. Since Rabbi Meir did not mention the case of a nether prohibiting Dagan, it is evident that he holds that such a nether includes all type of grain, even those not of the five species. And the Mephoshim explained Rabbi Meir holds since the word Dagan means pile, it is used by people to refer to any produce that is stored in piles. Since beans and seeds and certainly rice and millet are stored in piles, they are included in the term Dagan, in the Rav's version of the Mishnah Rabbi Meir, is explicitly quoted as saying that a nedel made with the word Dagan includes all species, but since we don't have it here, we're inferring it. However, the Mishnah concludes, the sages say, Someone who makes a nedel prohibiting himself from eating Dagan is forbidden to eat only the five species, but he is permitted to eat other species of grain, because according to the Chachamim, people use the term Dagan in the same way they use the term Tivua, Therefore, when people say the word Dagan, they mean only the five species. And the Rav says, Another ruling that involves the five species of grain relates to Chala and Ma'asrot. Again, Ma'asrot are the tides that must be separated from produce grown in Eretz Yisrael. The Mishnah says, The five species are subject to the obligations of both Chala and Ma'asrot, meaning only these species can become subject, can be subject to both obligations. However, other species are certainly subject to the Amaser obligation, like we exp- like like we will explain in Mishnah. Four. In addition, produce of the five species are not always subject to both obligations, but both these five species will always be subject to the obligations of both Chala and Maasod. The Mishnah mentions this here in order to contrast with the cases that will be mentioned in the next two Mishnayot, where there's either only a Chala obligation or a Maaser obligation, and that is in Rabotai of Mishnah. But Mishnah Gimel now continues to discuss based off the previous Mishnah that taught that the five species of grain are subject to both the Chala and Ma'asrot obligation. This Mishnah, Mishnah Gimel, this case is where produce of the five species have a Chala obligation but do not have a Ma'asr obligation. Elu chayevin b'chala upturim mina Ma'asrot. The following are subject to Chala but exempt from Ma'asrot. The Mepharshim explained just to intru- as an introduction. The Torah requires that a number of tides be separated from produce. These are the following. Tirumah Gidula, which is given to a Kohen. Midorite, there's no minimum amount that must be given as Tirumah, but the rabbis set a minimum amount, typically one-fiftieth of the produce, 2%. Maaser Rishon is number two. The first tithe, which is one-tenth of the remaining produce, which is given to a Levi. Then we have Tirumad Maaser, one-tenth of the Maaser Rishon, which the Levi separates and gives to a Kohen. Then we have, depending on the cycle, Maaser Shini or Maaser Ani. Maaser Shini would be one-tenth of the crop remaining after Tiruma and Maaser Rishon were separated. And it would be separated from crops of the first, second, fourth, and fifth year of the seven-year Shemitah cycle. And in Yerushalayim, and on year three and six, instead of Maaser Shini, we would separate one-tenth of the crop and um, give it to the poor now, technically, the word ma'asrot applies only to gifts that are a tenth of the produce, but in practice, the term is commonly used when referring to any of these gifts. So the Mishnah says, Elu chayevin b'chala upturim in ma'asrot, the following are subject to chala obligation, but except for ma'asrot, ha-leket v'ashichah v'ha-pe'ah, the gifts to the poor of leket, shichah, and pe'ah, leket gatherings, they refer to one or two stocks that fall down as the grain is harvested. The Torah says in Seba Vayikra, chapter 19, Pasuk 19, these stocks must be left in the field for the poor. Then we have Shicha forgotten, which refers to the sheaves of grain that the owner forgot in the field. The Torah says in Sevel Dvarim, chapter 24, Pasuk 19, these must also be left for the poor. Then we have Pe'ah, which literally means end. It's a section of the field that the field owner must sleep for the poor to harvest. They're uh, brought down in the Sevel Vayikra, chapter 19, Pasuk 19. So the Mishnah teaches that if one of the five types of grain were collected as Leket, Shicha, or Pe'ah, Hala must be separated from them when eating them into dough, but not ma'asrot. Va'efker and ownerless grain. So if the Mishnah says va'efker, right? Ownerless grain. So the Mishnah say, for example, if someone declared his grain ownerless, even if the grain was then acquired by another person, it's exempt from ma'asrot. Now this applies only if the grain was made ownerless before it was completely processed. 
before it was smoothed into a pile. But if it was declared onus after that time, it's still subject to tithing. Now, these are exempt from Maasel because the Maasel obligation applies only to produce that has an owner and that a Levi has no right to take. Now, since these gifts may be taken by a Levi, they are not subject to the Maaser obligation. And Varshim explained, we learned from a Pasuk in Sefer Dvarim, chapter 14, Pasuk 29. It says, The Levi shall come because he has no portion or inheritance with you. So the Varshim say that Maaser Rishon is given to a Levi only from produce that the Levi would not be otherwise allowed to take from himself. Right, whatever you have and he doesn't have, that's what you have to give him. But if he has the right to take it also, like Leket Shicha and Pea, which can be taken by a poor Levi, and also Ornul's game, which can be taken by a poor Levi, they are exempt from Maaser. They remain exempt even if someone later acquires them, and even if he does so before the grain is processed. And the Mishnah, the Mishnah con continues, the Mifashim explain, since these gifts may be taken by a Levi, like we said, they're not subject to the Maaser obligation, but nevertheless, they are still subject to the Hala obligation, because we learn from a Pasuk that the exemption of Leket, Shicha, and Pea, and Onlus grain does not apply to Hala. However, they are subject to Hala, again, only if someone acquired the grain before it's made into dough, which is when the Hala obligation takes effect. If the dough was ownerless at the time that it was needed, it's not subject to the obligation of Chala. It, Maran speaks about this more in Shukhanu Chedek Yorodea, Siman 330, Alakha 7. The Mishnah continues, Also, a case where it's subject to Chala, but except for Maaser, is Maaser Rishon, whose Tiruma was taken, the Tirumat Maaser, but Tiruma Gedula was not separated by the owner, meaning the Levi separated Tirumat Maaser from the Maaser Rishon. Right, the Levi separated Tirumat Maaser from the Maaser Rishon. The Mishnah is teaching that the, rem that the remaining Maaser is exempt from tithing, but is obligated in Chala. The reason we will explain soon. Right, in the Mepharshim say the case is again the Levi separated Tirumat Maaser from the Maaser Rishon. This is speaking of when Maaser Rishon was separated before the grain became obligated in Tirumat Gedola. Now the Mishnah is discussing a case where the Israel separated Maaser Rishon from his unprocessed grain before he separated Tirumat Gedola. So the halacha is that, pro, that produce becomes subject to the obligation of Tirumat and Maaser only after it is fully processed, like we learned in Mesechet Maaser chapter 1 at Mishnah 5. Had the Israel separated Maaser Rishon after the grain was processed, without first separating Tirumat Maaser, the Levi would have, be, would have been obligated to separate Tirumat Gedola, since in that case the Tirumat Gedola requirement had already come into effect and was not yet fulfilled. But here, however, the Israel separated Maaser before the grain was processed. We learn from a Pasuk, if Maaser Rishon was separated from grain that was not yet subject to Tirumat Gedola, it never becomes subject to Tirumat Gedola. So therefore, even when the Levi later finishes processing the Maaser Rishon, he does not have to separate Tiruma Gedola. And the Pasuk that exempts Maaser Rishon that was separated from unprocessed grain is speaking only with regards to Maaserot, but it is still subject to Hala. U Maaser Shini Vektesh and Ifdu, the Mishnah continues, Maaser Shini and Hektesh that were redeemed, they're also subject to Hala, but exempt from Maaser. And the Mepharshim explain, Maaser Shini, we learned, must be brought to Yerushalayim and eaten there. It can also be redeemed with money, which is brought to Yerushalayim and used to buy food. Once Maaser Shini is redeemed, the produce no longer has sanctity and it may be eaten even outside of Yerushalayim. Hektesh refers to items consecrated to the Bet Mikdash. When Hekdash is redeemed, its sanctity is removed. So the Mishnah is teaching that once they are redeemed, Maaser Shini and Hekdash are subject from are exempt from Maasrot, but they are still subject to Hala. And the Farshim say Maaser Shini that was redeemed is speaking of a case where it was separated before the grain was obligated in Maasrot. Now, the Mepharshim say the case of Maaser Shini is similar to the previous case of Maaser Rishon. So instead of separating Maaser Shini from the processed grain, after Tirumah Gedola and Maaser Rishon were separated as required, 
the owner separated Maser Shini from the unprocessed grain before Tehuma Gedula and Maser Shini were, sep Maser Shini were separated. So since the Maser Shini was separated before the grain was processed, at which time the grain had no Tehuma Gedula or Maser Shini obligation, the Maser Shini is exempt from these tithes. Now the exemption of Maser Shini that was separated while the grain was unprocessed does not apply to Chala, and this is only true if it was redeemed before it was made into dough. If it was redeemed afterwards, it's exempt from Chala as well, because Maser Shini is considered to be divine property, but in any event, that's what the case of Maser Shini is referring to. Hagdish that was redeemed is exempt, because it does not belong to the owner when the Maser obligation took effect. And the Mephoshim explained, the case of Hagdish is also where the grain was designated as Hagdish before it was processed and was then redeemed. We learned from a pasuk that only privately owned produce is subject to Tugumot Maasrot. Produce of Hegdish is not subject to Tugumot Maasrot. Now, although the Hegdish was later redeemed, it remains exempt. The reason being because it was owned by Hegdish at the time when the tithing obligation takes effect, which is when the processing of the grain was complete. Now, unlike in the earlier cases, in the case of Hegdish, it is exempt from Tehumat Masot only if it was redeemed after it was processed. Now, Hegdish that was redeemed is subject to Chala. Now, in actuality, we're going to see later on that the exemption of Hegdish does apply to Chala. But our Mishnah is referring to a case where the grain of Hegdish was redeemed before it was made into dough. Since the Chala obligation takes effect on the dough, not on the grain. When the Chala obligation took, took effect, it was no longer Hegdish and it is subject to Chala. And the Mishnah continues, Umotara Omer, also subject to Chala but exempt from Maser, are the leftovers of the Korban Omer, the Omer offering. And the Mephoshim explained, this refers to the extra flour that, was re that remained after the Omer offering was prepared. The Omer was made from very fine barley flour. Therefore, a large amount of barley would be brought with money of Hegdish. The barley would be ground and then sifted many times until a small amount of very fine flour was produced. This leftover flour was redeemed. I'm sorry. A large amount of barley would be bought with money of Hegdish. Again, the barley would be ground, sifted many times until a small amount of very fine flour was produced. Now, the leftover flour was redeemed, therefore permitting it for other use. Now, the barley for the Omer was bought and became Hegdish while it was still unprocessed and was still owned by Hegdish when its processing was completed. So, essentially, the leftovers of the Omer are Hegdish that was redeemed. Therefore, they are exempt from Ma'asrod but subject to Hala. And the Mishnah continues, Utvua Shiloh Evia Shalish, also subject to Hala, but exempt from Ma'aser is grain that did not grow a third of its full growth. Only grain that has grown enough that it will grow if replanted is obligated Ma'asrod. Since grain that has grown less than a third will not grow if replanted, it's exempt from Ma'asrod. We learned this also from Pasuk the Rav says. We, we also spoke about this a little bit in Masechet Ma'asrod, Mishnayot, chapter 1, Mishnah 3. Now, however, with regards to Chala, this exemption does not apply, meaning the Chala obligation applies even if the grain is not suitable for replanting, for as long as grain can ferment, it is subject to the Chala obligation, and even grain that grew less than a third can ferment. The Mishnah concludes by bringing the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer, who disagrees with regards to grain that grew less than a third. Rabbi Eliezer, Omer, Rabbi Eliezer says, Grain that did not grow a third is exempt from Chala, because Rabbi Eliezer learns from a pasuk that the laws of Chala are compared to the laws of Teruma, just as grain that did not grow third is exempt from Teruma, it is also exempt from Chala. And then Farshim explained, Rabbi Eliezer agrees that all the other exemptions of the Mishnah do not apply to Chala. The reason being because the pasuk compares Chala to Teruma only with regards to exemptions that relate to the produce itself, like in our case where it didn't grow enough. But the other exemptions of Tehumot and Masrot are because of the ownership of the produce, or in the case of Maser Rishon and Maser Shini, because the produce they were separated, the, because the produce they were separated from was not processed. Therefore, those exemptions do not apply to Chala. But this specific case, um, again, the because the pasuk compares Chala to Tiruma only regarding exemptions that relate to the produce itself, which is in our specific case where it did not grow enough. The Rav says Ve'ar the halacha does not follow Rabbi Eliezer. That is in Rabotai of today's Mishnah Rumi. Everybody should have a Erev Shabbat Shalom. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen v'amen.